Hey, what is up, Omni Athletes? If you have not registered yet for the 2019 Future of Sport Conference, do it today. Go to live.theomniathlete.com. This conference is truly going to transform the way you look at sport, the way you compete in sport. And if you are a coach or a leader who's working to bring sports consciousness into your team, into your organization, into your client base, whoever it is that you serve, and you need help building that bridge in translating the practices of higher consciousness, the practices of meditation, mindfulness, EFT, training principles around energetics and embodiment, and how that all translates into athletic performance and in a way that you can communicate its value, and by extension, the value you deliver in being able to to bring that work to sport and to the world, this is the conference for you to be at. We are gonna have an incredible list of speakers and teachers that all have gone through the journey of translating that work, that value, that power into athletic performance and into peak performance for sport, for life, through movement. So be there July 19th through 21st in San Francisco, the Future of Sport Conference. Go to live.theomniathlete.com to register today. Grab your ticket. We'll see you guys in San Francisco. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a really special episode of Omni Athlete this week. We have decided to put together a little panel in advance of the Future Sport Conference coming up this July. And on our panel today, we've got three incredible guests. And the first, if you guys are watching this, you're going to see uh, me go around the horn. If you're listening to this, I'm just going to go kind of in a random order here. So first is Scott Bottorf. Scott is a fascia specialist. He's a former professional hockey player and bodybuilder as well. You guys have heard Scott on the podcast before. Really energizing perspective around fascia and the health. Next is Kat Tripoli. Kat is a world champion bodybuilder. She's an award-winning author and entrepreneur as well. And has you guys have heard her on the podcast as well before too. Has brought an incredible amount of focus to this idea of conscious fitness and really intention and the energy and honoring all our bodies as we build our physical body. And last but certainly not least is Laura Wild. And Laura, did I say that right, Laura? Is your last name Wild? Yes. Love yes. it. Okay. Thank you, yes. Yeah, you're welcome. So Laura is current MBA mindfulness and mental performance coach. She's also a sports metaphysician and works with MLB and NBA athletes on really accessing their cosmic self, their quantum abilities and capabilities as performers and as human beings. So I cannot think of three people more qualified to talk about the future of sport, and we're we're really excited to have them here and dive into this. So to start this conversation, I'm actually going to tee it up with a little bit of a surprising question. And Laura, I'm going to start with you. What was it that called you into sport at first? It was, uh, it was something that I noticed I was good at. And I got quite a bit of attention when I was in running across the field in PE. They would talk about, wow, you're going to be a great one- runner one day. So it was my first thought of the future as a grown up and, you know, not, ha- not being able to be grounded. So I think it's just that early on, I noticed that, wow, people really appreciate this in me. And when I'm a grown up, I could be good at this. So I was really like a nine or a 10 year old and I love PE class. So that's just where I kind of took that. Awesome. Awesome. Kat, what about you? What pulled you in? You know, I think what pulled me in honestly was kind of the opposite <laughs> of Laura. Uh, you know, I think it was, I think it was the, the struggle, um, for control, for autonomy, for, which is, you know, truth be told, probably the reason I went into bodybuilding sure. as opposed to some sort of team sport, because it was me and against myself, me trying to see what I could do with my body, me seeing what my limits were and could I crash through those limits, um, just by focusing my mind. Um, so I think it was for me, it was the, um, wanting to get some sort of control of my life of coming from a, uh, you know, a cult background, uh, where your thoughts were not yours and, um, you were very limited, you know, and once I got out of that, I, I think that bodybuilding for me gave me a real sense of personal power, Mm. you know, and then that kind of snowballed into, you know, oh my God, this is actually raising my consciousness. You know, this is creating this whole different uh, um, level of my being. You know, I am not this one dimensional um, thing that moves through the planet. I've got a mental, an emotional, a spiritual, a physical body. 
And um, I, I just felt like if I could bring all those things into alignment, then I would be a much more whole person. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. Scott, what about you? Um, well, I think mine's a little more simple. Uh, <laughs> I was, old, I was four years old. Uh, and, uh, my mom was, uh, she was into figure skating. So I was in San Diego, uh, watching her, um, figure skate from the stands. And then after she had finished, uh, the Zamboni came out, they did the ice, uh, she took her skates off, so on. And then, uh, then these, this, these people came out with sticks and helmets and they, they were, they were hitting this little black disc. And I didn't know what it was, but I told my mom, I was like, mommy, what is that? And, uh, and she goes, well, that's hockey. And she goes, I mean, she's like, I'm like, I want one of those sticks. I want to do that. And so, you know, being a four-year-old, it was an amount of excitement and joy, but also there was something that like, I was so curious, like, what was this sport? I've never seen this before. And obviously then that like, you know, led to a lot of endeavors, you know, to, for performance and health, longevity, so on, and development. But it, it was like this uh, spark of excitement, but also curiosity. And like, what is this sport? Thanks, Scott. Kat, I'm going to start with this next question with you, and we're going to go around again, too. So you each have different different pieces of the experience of sport that pulled you into it. And I, I'm going to ask you now, what was the point in your journey as an athlete that was the most transformational for you? And Kat, we'll let you start. Okay. You know, I, in speaking with all of you, I realized that there is a bit of a um, separation between uh, what I do because for the most part, what I do in the gym, the sport aspect is not, really where the competition is you know it becomes more more art on stage it, it's not you know the hockey puck <laughs> that scott has or or you know the, the sink in that basket um it's kind of much more uh watery uh it's art it's it's you know something else so it's kind of a, a different i'm trying to gather my thoughts on that because um you know, it's, I just feel like it's a little bit different. Uh, so you might me, need to come back to me so I can formulate my thoughts on that because it's, it's just tough for me right now. Let's do it. Let's do it. Scott, what about you? What was a either the moment or a moment in sport as an athlete that just really transformed you as a human being? <laughs> Not that easy, is it? I'm sitting here, wait a minute. Uh, there's an event <laughs> that comes up um, that comes to mind immediately. And so I'm just going to go with it. Please. Um, so whenever I was 15 years old, I played for uh, Denver University's amateur hockey. And uh, we were, it was in the Bantam uh, AA regional playoffs. And we were losing against the best team in the league or in the region. They're little to Hawks. And so... Uh, we were down four to two and it was in the second period and everyone on our team was being very pessimistic and very negative and almost pumping up the other team being like, Oh, they're so good. Um, what are we going to do? You know? And they, and I was like, well, I was like, I don't, in my mind, I was like, I don't believe what they're saying. I believe we can win. And so I, I went out and then the face off, I went out there and I scored a goal and I was like, Oh, cool. So we're only down by one. goal. And then what's the face off again? And then I, I scored another goal and I was like, I don't even know how I did that move. It was like so smooth and seamless, you know? And then we were tied within 15 seconds. And so then, uh, I went out, we, my coach said, stay out, stay out, Scott, stay out. You know? So I stayed out and then I scored a third goal and it was like, it, it's like my, I was a spectator to my body. I was doing movements that. I wasn't controlling. I was like eating popcorn and stadium seating be like, Oh wow, Scott, that was incredible. How'd you do that? <laughs> but there was the, I mean, it does actually connect to what you're talking about. There is finesse and flow in hockey because it is so dynamic. And so that it can also not, it, hockey obviously gets portrayed as a very rough sport, but whenever that you are not united team at the same plane, 
this seamless movements and they're connected. They only have to look at each other and they can move the puck to each other. But this movement, this, this, this like uh, sports moment had me feel the zone more, you know, than I had ever felt it before, you know? And so that, uh, led me into scoring three goals in 38 seconds, which used to be a USA hockey scoring record, but it wasn't because wow. I made it happen. It's because I, I, it's like I yielded, I yielded to, to, to like, um, uh, whatever was going on, the emotions, I didn't get locked in everyone else's emotions, everyone else's doubts. I believed. And through that belief, the, the unconscious took over. And then my conscious was like, wow, I didn't even know I could do these things, but then that, that, that proved to me that I can do that and not just in hockey, but this can be done in life. And it's just like, and it's like, now I know that, that there's that possibility. Mm. Thanks Scott. Laura, what about you? Well, my is similar to Scott's in that when I was about 17, I read a book on ESP and I read the power of positive thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And I got very, I got very diligent about improving my shot. I was, I ran track and I was a high school basketball player. And I noticed that my improvement changed and everything changed. And I had this moment because, you know, I started to feel like I was dancing when I was playing basketball. Instead of it being hard, instead of me studying, I was, I felt like I was dancing and I was never injured. I just felt like I was floating. And there was this moment in track when I was running in the mile relay. And when I got the baton, I was, we were in sixth place and I wasn't even that great at the 400 at that point. It was still a new race to me. So I ran my one lap around the track and got our team to second place. I was the third leg, which is usually the weak leg. So I was the third leg. I think it's the weak leg. And I was able to hand the baton off to my teammate in second place. And she took us to first and the, the entire track team and the whole, you know, the staff of the school and the track coaches kept saying, Oh my God, what were you doing out there? And I remember just not feeling like I was doing anything. And I started to realize that that's what the zone felt like. And I would make myself up little affirmation cards. And, you know, my parents didn't even know that I was doing this, but I would constantly train my mind to focus on being positive and to imagine the shot going in. And it just became, you know, effortless when I could access that, but I still didn't know how to access it on demand. But those are the moments when I first started experiencing this type of stuff. Yeah. Wow. Kat, we're going to come, we're going to come back to you. What was a moment or the moment? You know, I don't know that there was a moment or the moment. I it just, I felt like pretty much what they're describing most of the time, because I've always felt that um, what I was doing was a moving meditation, to be quite honest. Um, I was always, I trained alone. I, you know, I didn't really train with a partner. So it was so internal that I don't, feel like there was one moment you know that all of a sudden it was the, the closest I could come to explaining that was the moment in the very beginning when I was lifting weights and over I don't know it might have been the first few weeks and all of a sudden I saw my body change and I was able to lift more weight than I ever thought that I could and it just was this real sense of oh my gosh, this is possible and I'm in control of it. Um, and it always felt like a flow state. It still does to this day when I lift. Um, but again, lifting is very different than, than being on stage. <laughs> you know, um, what I'm doing in the gym is, is uh, definitely a different thing than once I get up there to, to kind of show the fruits of that labor. Um, so I've always felt very in touch with it. It just, something I just, self in love with and uh, my body took to it and i don't know that there was a you know a big cataclysmic you know um thing that that happened i'm i'm used to that flow state so let's jump now thank you all three of you guys that, those different stories but at the same time all interconnected and I want to get a little tactical now in our next question. So all three of you are coaches in varying capacities and with varying levels of skill, right? You've all worked with extremely world-class athletes and you've all worked with youth athletes just, you know, or the, so to speak, average citizen who just wants to really find a new path forward through their body. Scott, I'm going to st start with you. Then we'll go Laura and then Kat. What has been for you one of the biggest challenges you've seen with somebody who wants to make a change in how they perform 
opening up to maybe a different path forward? Okay. Once again, yeah. You come up with very nice questions. <laughs> um, so, um, so again, what comes to my mind first is, uh, for some odd reason, Olympic athletes that I've worked with. And the reason is, and this is true for all athletes, but Olympic athletes seem to admit this the most, which is there's not a, there, they, they don't know the separation between emotionality and physicality. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, this is something, obviously you have like the spirituality or the energy and so on. And you have like, you know, the psychology and so on, like Kat was saying, you know, it's four dimensional, obviously we're not, we'll walk around four dimensional. And so the thing is that, uh, a lot of times, uh, people and athletes will do movements out of emotions. They can do movements out of ideals. Okay. They can do movements out of analyzations. Yeah, or they can do movements from their body, you know, kinesthetically. But the big thing I see in, ath in athletics, and even my work now with even top level athletes, is that there is a, so much uh, of that old theory of no pain, no gain mm -hmm. is still being reinstilled, even in professional teams. These are athletes making mm -hmm. well over $10 million a year, and they're still installing uh, work harder. It's more about no pain, no gain. Whenever that's emotionality, emotions uh, can give you that, you know, it gives you effort, you know. However, emotions aren't your physical body, okay? But now let's talk about calming down the nervous system, okay? Because we know that the nervous system and the hormones are married, okay? So the thing is that most athletes are unable to calm down those nervous systems so they could feel their body so they can direct a conscious attention onto like, oh, I'm trying to shoot the basketball, but my arm does not externally rotate so much because there's something in the back of my shoulder that's blocking and it hurts. Now, that's what we want to get is having the body come up to the athlete. I mean, you can do use effort and through emotionality and you can win the race. But then after the body is garbage, like they literally can't walk with athletes they're like oh i won mm -hmm. i won a gold medal but now my shoulder's blown out and then they never could beat again and then they say and so it's like what i want to really do you know it seems like emotions are great but and i know we talked about this before is that you know we want to be able to harness and get a calm state you know and not just be driven by emotions because emotions if too emotional put it off the nervous system and puts you into a sympathetic state or now you're trying to micromanage a very intricate thing being your nervous system and brain uh, with your mind, but your mind is not your brain, okay? So it's like, how can you take a tape recorder of everything you've ever experienced in the mind and then make it work, the neural network of the brain? Like it doesn't have the blueprint of all the working parts. And so that's the big thing for me. And, and, I, and it's been a constant thing with like, especially Olympic, Olympic athletes, they're like, oh, I ran harder, but I went slower. And I'm like, yeah, you have to move. You have to learn how to move slow to get fast. And so that happens to do with removing your all these like uh, amazing, you have amazing intentions and emotions, but now let's calm the emotions and let's build, let's get the nervous system back on. And then now let's build attention. And then emotion, you add emotion to that. Now that's powerful because now you're working with a body and you have a tension of the body and there's a consciousness to it. And then now emotion can now fuel, can fuel you in a different way. But some, a lot of athletes get too emotional because they're, they're told to work harder, 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 more, 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 but none of them are recovering because they're all over training. Mm. So, so that integration piece, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, Laura, let, let's go to you. What's been the biggest hurdle you've seen to athletes at any level making that leap to, to really being able to take a new step forward? So uh, I actually have experienced a lot of the things that Scott mentioned where they, they see themselves as a physical body and don't understand their complexities. Uh, in my work, my biggest hurdle is having them be willing to sit in stillness. They're such mm -hmm. doing beings that they always want to be doing something yeah. and it's a it's, it's almost a huge mind-blowing idea i always make a pie chart and in the pie chart i say this is how much time you spend on your physical game right now 
and I just make the pie chart completely black. And then I take another color and I show them a new pie chart and say, just imagine if you spend a sliver of your time working on your mental game too, because then you're actually going to be able to get better and improve and your physical body won't be so exhausted if you actually do some of your rehearsal and with your mental and with your mind. So for me, one of the biggest hurdles is convincing people who are worried about their job to slow down, including, you know, whether it's staff or athletes, it's hard in the world of pro sports, people to feel like if I slow down, I can be better because it feels as if they're losing something and they think someone else is going to get better than them. So it's really is convincing people that the mental game is vital. And then, you know, in my work, I have them see themselves as having five bodies. And I look at the, I call one of them uh, the cosmic body. Some people call it the bliss body. And this is an old theory. It's not mine. It's Amika Swami, the quantum physicist or the quantum doctor has this theory so I use the theory with the athletes, which they really like that there's a cosmic body and a supra mental body, like S U P R A mental, which is their the wisdom and the intuition, and then the mental body and the emotional body and the physical body. And for me, the hardest thing is to get them to see that they're complex and that each one of these matters, and that when they get out of the way of the negative mental constructs and their emotional body, their physical body will perform better. And once they see it once, they can never unknow it. They always, from then on, recognize that. It's really the convincing of this is a, to me, it's not new. It's been around forever. I did it when I was 17 and in my 40s. For some reason, it's still new to these young athletes and even to, you know, to executives in pro sports. So that's the hardest thing for me is, you know, I'm not preaching to the choir once I enter into pro sports. But when I'm talking to guys like you and and Kat, you know, you guys really understand that. So for me, I walk out there like, wait, how do you guys not know this? So just understanding that not everyone has, you know, come to this level yet. That's powerful. And I, I think we're going to come back to that because there's a consistent question. You know, one of one of the questions we hope to answer at this conference is how we build this bridge in an appropriate way as coaches, as people, even just as leaders. So I think building that bridge and getting the athlete to a point where they feel confident in owning that transformation and having that moment of, of realization is really critical. And there's a lot of missteps we can take along the way. Kat, for you, what's been one of the biggest challenges you've seen athletes go through in making that transformation? Boy, I can really relate to both Scott and Laura on this one because I think, uh, you know, when something that Scott said really, um, you know, fired me up there, which is true, is that we sort of glorify the broken athlete. You know, we we glorify that athlete that runs so hard that they their legs completely collapse and they lose all their autonomic function and you know it's it's kind of especially in the bodybuilding world that no pain no gain thing got pounded in a little too much you know and we do end up being these one-dimensional physical beings and people think that you can beat that into doing what you want it to do and i'm doing the same thing i'm trying to get these people to understand that it's vision It's conscious directing with a certain level of, like Scott said, non-emotion, right? It's, It's stepping back and watching the dance, the interplay of your physiology and your breath and, you know, your bone and your blood and your muscle. And then consciously requesting for your body to do something. And so to do that, everything has to slow down. And when I, when I look at athletes trying to train, I just see this, this vibration that to me looks like um, the old pinball game. You know, ball goes flying off one side, goes flying off the other, and there's no cohesion. And so to, to get that cohesion to where they can direct their body, I feel like that's the hardest thing for me is to get them to slow down mm-hmm. and breathe and really feel the nuances, you know, and to, to what am I feeling? This this arm hurts, but that's that's how it feels physically. But how does that feel to you mentally? How does that feel to you emotionally? How does that feel to you spiritually? And once I can do that, then it seems seems that they just sort of slow down naturally because it becomes, like I said, a moving meditation. And but that's it's just it's just something that takes time and and practice and guidance. I think. Guys, this was. 
incredible. Thank you all, Laura. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Like this, wow. For you guys watching, this is the reason why you have to be at this conference is because there are there are coaches and athletes like this out there in the world that are not just talking but are doing. So no matter whether you're an athlete who wants to perform better or whether you're a coach who knows that there is a different level you can get your players to both on the field, in the court, wherever it may be, and as human beings, this is the place you need to be to be able to experience this knowledge, this wisdom, and this application from people actually in the world bringing it to you. So please join us at the conference. The website to register is live.theomniathlete.com. Real quick, guys, where can they go to connect with each of you? So Laura, where can these guys go if they want to connect with you? Um, probably the easiest thing for me is on Instagram and it's uh, Grace Laura Wild, G-R-A-C-E and then Laura Wild. And Wild has an E at the end. Grace Laura Wild on Instagram. Awesome. Kat, what about you? Where can they go? Uh, probably the easiest would be cat.consciousfitness at gmail.com. Awesome. That awesome. would be Scott? the easiest way to get hold of me right now. Great. Great. Scott, what about you? Um, you can check out my website. It's called aspireflex.life. Uh, my email is on there, which is scott at aspireflex.life. Awesome. All right, guys. We'll see you at the conference. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Omni Athlete. Hey, hey, what is up, guys? Thank you for watching another episode of Omni Athlete. Please, please, please go like and subscribe to our podcast. That is our goal right now is just to build this community as big as we possibly can. And we need your help to do it. So like and subscribe, share our content. Guys, if if this content adds any value to your world that helps you perform, connect, go deeper, go wider, Whatever it is that it does for you, if it provides value, all we ask is that you share our content and help grow this community. We can't accomplish our goal of elevating global consciousness through sport without you. You are an integral part of this mission and this purpose, and we need your help. So please go like, subscribe, and share our content and continue to help us build and grow this community that is truly motivated to not just elevate consciousness, but elevate and shift the very culture of sport so that we can truly experience the athletic experience in a brand new and energizing way for so, so many people, guys. So thank you. And please like and subscribe until next time.